Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining today's web conference, the City National Rockdale Weekly Economic and Investment Update. My name is Ben Getch, and I'm a senior analyst here at City National Rockdale. With us today, we have Garrett D'Alessandro, our CEO, Tom Galvin, our CIO, Senior Portfolio Manager Lindsay Cook, and Portfolio Manager Rachel Crane. The views and estimates you hear today are sourced from our Investment Committee's weekly meetings. This reflects more than 100 years of combined experience in financial markets. During today's call, Garrett will begin with our prepared remarks and provide an update on the coronavirus outbreak. Tom will discuss the economy, portfolio positioning, and the election. They will then be followed by our two other speakers. Lindsay uh, will be discussing opportunistic income. And Rachel will discuss our process for integrating goals into portfolio construction and portfolio management. At the end of the presentation, we will all be on the line to answer any questions we receive from you during the webinar. Just a few logistics before we get started. We welcome any questions, so please type them into your console's Q&A window anytime during the session. And if you would like to download a copy of the presentation slides, you can do so in the resources window to the right on your council. We look forward to sharing our insights on the progression of the coronavirus outbreak, the economic environment, and our resulting portfolio recommendations. I'll now turn the call over to Garrett D'Alessandro, CEO of City National Rockdale. Thank you, Ben. Hello, everyone. The title for today's presentation is Economic and COVID Progress, Vaccines Versus the Flu Season. Let me cover some of the major developments this week. It was actually a very busy week. Two different but very prominent COVID forecasting services have put out uh, substantially different fatality estimates through November and December. And we'll talk more about uh, the importance of that uh, in my uh, talk about COVID. Colleges uh, we're seeing are not exactly demonstrating being institutions of higher learning with respect to COVID as uh, several of them are uh, seeing uh, flare ups and subsequently uh, closing down uh, the in-person uh, teaching. Um, so more on that. Uh, vaccines, uh, we had a little bit of a surprise negative last night, AstraZeneca is actually halting their um, um, research, but Pfizer CEO said progress looks likely to be announced in November. That's just the phase three, not the actual production and distribution. We really won't know the true safety of the vaccines until many millions of people have taken uh, the vaccine. We do think there's gonna be a global uh, scramble when they do get into the production and the distribution of the vaccine, and it's potential that it's going to become a fairness issue across uh, different countries. High flying stocks have corrected, uh, as those that have been listening to us know, that's no surprise to us. Neither those are, those are not the stocks that we invest, uh, nor do we think the end of those uh, irrationally uh, overvalued stocks uh, is at the end. We think valuations in the less mature um, stocks are quite risky. Uh, on the economy, generally across many of the metrics, we see gradual continued recovery. We're increasingly disappointed with the failed stimulus. Last night, they announced a limited stimulus package. Uh, we think that's inadequate, but uh, let's see uh, whether that gets approved. We're seeing more of the initially announced temporary furloughs turning into permanent job losses. And Tom's got a very insightful chart on that. Um, this is the uh, about the election. We're just looking at polls. This is not our opinion. Uh, the average of many of the polls um, still show that Biden is favored. Uh, the Senate, the average of those polls uh, shows that the race is quite uh, close and not able to be uh, leaning one way or the other. We have really watched for business reopenings, and the bottom line there is the overwhelming majority of businesses have no defined plan on uh, a reopening uh, program. On the uh, European and China, very interesting uh, turn of events. The European countries uh, diplomatically essentially turned against China after many years of um, 
I guess, uh, trying to put up with what China was doing. Uh, they they came together and they turned against China and they're going to become more resistant to uh, the notion of unfettered free trade with China. More to come on that. That's a very significant development. The Investment Committee, as you know, uh, comprised of five executives that have many years of ex investment experience. Uh, we've done several changes uh, we want to talk about. We've raised our expectations for GDP for the third quarter and for the full year slightly better on both. Earnings, uh, Tom's going to talk about that. Generally coming in better for companies, not all industries, of course, if you're in the airline or hospitality, they're not better, but many of the other businesses are coming in slightly better than expected. Uh, we still remain concerned about the 13.6 million unemployed workers, and we really need to see um, our government come through with the proper extension of supplemental benefits to sustain uh, their um, contribution to economic uh, progress. Consumer net worth, we talked about this, is at a record, $123 trillion. That's up uh, from the before pandemic level. And what that, why that's important is that is the source of future spending uh, resident across uh, the individuals in the United States. Existing home sales, booming uh, is probably the only way to categorize what's going on now. Those home sales are now higher than before the uh, COVID uh, crisis. Manufacturing still at low levels, um, but the indicators are now almost all turning uh, from red to yellow to green. So that's a, a good sign. Uh, we talked about the failed stimulus plan. Uh, for, let's talk about the municipalities. So 49 states legally require a balanced budget. Uh, they have a massive uh, budget deficit, over $580 billion of deficits. Uh, one way or the other, tax increases and spending cuts, they're going to have to solve uh, for that by uh, legal requirement uh, to solve their deficit uh, problem. The, that's the not so good news. The good news is many state and local governments entered or before the pandemic were in quite good fiscal situation. Again, not all states or cities. There were some obviously that weren't, but the majority of them were in pretty strong fiscal condition. So that helps a little bit overcome uh, the current bout that we're experiencing. The key point there is, as we do, uh, all of our municipal analysts know their bonds, know their credits. And yes, there will be plenty of downgrades. We're not concerned because we've scrutinized our bonds and feel we're in good shape there. Valuations for stocks still remains high, and we continue to uh, suggest to clients if it's suitable and appropriate, consider alternative strategies for better returns. You've seen this chart now for, I think, 25 weeks. Um, we've said uh, since late July, uh, we expected by September and October, we'd be back down to low levels for all hospitalizations, cases, and fatalities. Uh, we are uh, now getting close to or approaching the flu season uh, in another couple of weeks. Um, I talk about the two um, different forecasts. One very prominent forecasting service uh, put out a very stunningly negative, bad news situation. They think potential deaths could double from what they have been cumulatively so far through the end of the year. And we'll talk about the effect of that uh, flu seasonality. That's what they're basically using is a very complicated model. Happy to disclose what we what we have there. Uh, and they're saying the flu seasonality will link into and drive much higher uh, the case and the transmission of the coronavirus. The other very prominent uh, forecasting service uh, disagrees with that and says, no, we don't think there's going to be substantial increases in new cases and fatalities. Our assessment based on all of the scientific literature is no one knows what will happen. So we're saying this because we don't want what you're going to be seeing in terms of these shocking headlines, another doubling of debts. Uh, we wouldn't put much um, confidence in that yet. Going to Europe, uh, Spain continues to be a trouble spot. They haven't gotten that under control. Uh, France uh, looks like it's uh, becoming a, a flare up. We don't know if that's the tour to France or what's going on there, but the other countries, uh, UK, Germany, and Italy, quite frankly, are in good uh, shape. All right, so we, we're staying with these colored maps. 
And this is the test rate. And what we mean by that is if the test rate is above the threshold described by the CDC, 10%, that's not a good um, transmission or, or, or testing rate. So you can see in the middle of the country and in the Southeast, they're struggling to get that test rate down. But quite frankly, in many of the other states, uh, many green and yellow states are below the threshold. And that threshold is one of the key indicators on whether you can reopen small businesses, whether you go back to school, whether people can go about some normal uh, behavior. So we have 13 states that are red, but we have 38 that are yellow or green. So that's generally good. Now we're talking about the rate of change in the number of cases, right? So the prior page was level of test, uh, uh, and this is rate of change. This is July, and now we're gonna fast forward to September. And you can see uh, we still have red states in the upper and the central, and in the Ohio and Kentucky area, 15 states now are in a somewhat negative state. Now, one or two cases, I can talk about Florida. Um, Ben's made a good point. That turned, that was green, uh, yellow, sorry, turned red, but it was a very small flare up. So these red states are really on the edge of hopingly, or, pos or we're hoping will gradually uh, turn yellow over the next couple weeks, but we're still not really where we want to be in terms of the rate of change. This final chart uh, shows us the per capita level of cases. And this is really a good sign, right? You have very, very few states that have a level of per capita cases that are over this threshold uh, that is a concern. Many of the states are green or brownish, and that means they uh, have a moderate or low level of absolute number of cases, like I said in Florida. Okay, global, uh, again, this is cases per capita. So think of this as the, the balance sheet. You can see several of the countries are green or brown or gray, I'm sorry, uh, green uh, or brown is good. Uh, some are uh, uh, red, uh, not so good. Argentina, Brazil are notable. So again, generally, good, but not yet where we want to be. All right, so here's the big issue for us, right? So you have two forecasting services. Uh, the red bar is from the University of Washington. Uh, everyone should know that's uh, the Gates uh, Foundation supported. They do very, very good work. You can see sometime in October uh, that uh, death count zooms up. Um, this is a daily project projections where the other, the COVID-19 uh, YGG projections basically stays on this downward projection. And at the end of this um, a forecast, uh, we're gonna see, or at the end of the actual uh, flu season, we're gonna see which ones uh, are correct. But uh, we really don't want this flu season to kind of map over to the COVID and create a potential spike. It could create hospital capacity issues, not, not only uh, uh, you know, having another 200,000 deaths, that would really put us uh, backwards. And here's what we're talking about. So it's a very technical chart without getting into it. The red arrow at the bottom tells you where we are in the flu uh, cyclicality. We're right at that period in another couple of weeks um, in October. And normally the flu, this is, you know, known by pretty much everybody, uh, you're going to have a lot more flu cases. And what what some of these forecasts are saying is that's going to drive COVID up uh, deaths by more than 400,000 by the end of the year. We really don't uh, hope that comes to um, reality. Okay, so what's the good news? The good news is the vaccine timeline. Very late last night, um, AstraZeneca put their phase three trials on hold. I won't go into the details. It was um, a patient got particularly sick and they had some type of, of spinal cord inflammation and they had to stop that. But uh, the Pfizer and Moderna uh, trials are continuing, and both those CEOs think the trial results, not the production or the distribution, but the trial results um, could be in October or November. Then you need a lot of uh, other things to happen before you get into production and distribution. So the race is still on for the vaccine, and quite frankly, everyone wants to see some positive outcomes there. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our Chief Investment Officer, Tom Galvin. 
Thank you, Garrett, and hello, everyone. As this slide shows, the economic backdrop here in the U.S. continues to improve. On the top, we illustrate a subsection of our proprietary financial and economic speedometers that have improved uh, in recent weeks. Green dials such as housing and corporate profits, yellow dials such as business spending, outlook, and the international economic activity have improved. Even the red dial, we're expecting to see improvements in disposable income in coming weeks and uh, months. Now, reflecting these speedometers and numerous other high-frequency data metrics that we track, we have increased our forecast for uh, GDP in the U.S. in Q3 from a range of 10 to 12 percent to a range of 15 to 25 percent with a bias to the upper end of that range. Now, we did not change our expectations for Q4, still looking for 7 to 12 percent, a moderation from Q3. Uh, add it all up, our updated forecast for 2020 is a decline of roughly 4 to 5.3 percent, 4.7 kind of in the middle, and for 2021, we continue to remain at a relatively wide range, an optimistic range, but a wide range of three and a half to five and a half percent. This chart breaks down several key components that comprise GDP using consensus uh, forecasts here. Uh, the key takeaway from it is that for both Q3 and Q4, growth in economic activity is illustrated by the dark blue bar is coming and being supported by consumer consumption which generally represents roughly two-thirds of economic activity here in the U.S. Another important contributor to growth will be investments made by uh, corporations that need to expand or to rebuild their inventories. And those type of investments generally represent about 15% of economic activity. So the two of them are, are going to help provide a solid second half of the year for us. Now, because job creation is so critical, we dig deeply into numerous aspects as it relates to uh, jobs. And this slide here shows one of them, and that's the changes in non-farm payrolls. So after that steep plunge uh, that we all gasped at in April when it occurred, 21 million jobs lost when the economy went into lockdown mode, the pace of the improvement picked up steam going into June. Since then, the pace of the momentum in job creation has slowed in July and August as uh, coronavirus infections increased, the reopening process slowed somewhat. Indeed, the improvements in job creation we saw in the month of August was helped by the hiring of over 200,000 workers to help the U.S. with its census-taking process. So far, so good, though. We, we've had about half of the 21 million jobs lost have been returned about 10.6 uh, million. Now, another way to analyze the job market is to look at the unemployment stats. This chart shows the number of individuals that were unemployed by month broken into two categories. Uh, layoffs that were considered temporary, that's the black line, and those that were considered permanent, the gray bars at the bottom. In April, the temporary unemployed surged to over 18 million and has steadily declined reaching about 6 million recently. While there's, that is certainly good news and has contributed to the substantial drop in the unemployment rate to about 8.4%, the number of permanent job losses continues to climb. And is over 4.4 uh, 4, 4 million uh, due to cost pressures that companies are seeing, banks, uh, bank, bank, bankruptcies out there, business closures happening around the uh, country. So. Going forward, we do expect the pace of gains in temporary layoffs will continue, perhaps at a more modest pace, uh, but will be tempered by the increases in permanent losses that are likely to continue in, in coming months. Now, shifting gears for a moment, uh, my earlier slide on speedometers, just to drill into the international economic outlook a little bit, because that is important to the total uh, picture. Uh, this chart illustrates the severe slowdown that occurred in all major regions of the global economy, as highlighted in red. And the green bar shows the uh, expectations in growth in 2021 as forecasted by the IMF. As you can see, in developed markets, the U.S. decline in 2020 will be less severe than other developed regions and is expected to have a solid rebound in 2021. 
While the EU is forecasted to have a bigger rebound next year, we have more confidence in the projected rebound in the U.S. in 2021 due to the strong fiscal and monetary policy response here. And secondly, the EU next year is going to have to contend with a lot of things. Uh, Brexit is still out there, not discussed much, but that's still out there. And those continued headwinds from the demographic trends, the structural headwinds that we've talked about a a lot, that's that's going to continue. So we look at that forecast uh, a little uh, skeptically. And as a result of that and our four P's framework, we're continuing our overweight in uh, U.S. Um, equities, which has continued to work very well for us this year and over the last uh, six, seven years or so. Emerging markets uh, are expected, uh, as you can see on the uh, right side there, they're, they're expected to have the strongest economic recovery. Uh, this recovery combined with another meaningful advantage that uh, EM Asia has in our four piece framework, we continue to favor EM Asia over other emerging markets not only in our equity exposures, but in the um, credits that we own in our opportunistic uh, income uh, 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 strategy. So uh, very, very strength of our convictions overweighting US and emerging market Asia. Shifting to the election, uh, recent polling data um, has shown that the momentum that the Democrats had has slowed and uh, Biden's advantage is still solid, but it hasn't been increasing, roughly a 7% lead uh, based on the recent uh, polling data. Now, we all know that elections are determined by the Electoral College here, so what we show is an updated Electoral College map from Real Clear Politics and the current projections of which states are likely to vote for the Democrats in blue or the Republicans in red. Democrats appear to have uh, 213 electoral votes solidly in hand, while the Republicans have 116. The battle for the White House continues to reside within the brown states that we show here, of which there are about 209 votes up for uh, grabs, uh, most of which historically have leaned Republican. Now, one area we are keeping our eyes on overall is President Trump's approval rating in those important swing states that he won in 2016. Think Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Florida. Within those important swing states, um, the president's approval rating has been solidly consistent, but somewhat low still at around 43, 44%. Now, clearly approval ratings like polling data can change. And in our minds, the battle for the White House is gonna continue to come down to the wire. And with President Trump, you just never know what he may uh, be able to, to do to change the approval uh, rating. So stay, stay tuned there. As we look in the Senate, that race continues to remain tight. Uh, Democrats uh, appear likely to be winning 45 states. Republicans should have control of 46 states, but there are nine states up for grabs here too. Now of these nine states shown in, in, in brown, uh, we looked at the, the president's approval rating and it too is in the 43 or so um, area. So we'll be keeping our eyes on these key Senate races, watching how the White House goes, because very often how the White House goes has a big influence on how the uh, uh, Senate follows up. And keeping our eyes on the presidential debate uh, coming up at the end of the month, September 29th. Last topic I'd like to touch on is the recent performance of tech stocks. Clearly, tech stocks have been on fire this year. Fundamentals have been helped by the COVID crisis, uh, and these fundamentals are especially strong compared to other sectors of the economy that have been really hurt by the uh, COVID crisis. And on a long-term secular basis, tech does have more visibility in the future earnings growth. So these factors combined with very low interest rates have led to rising PEs, rising earnings, stocks really, really flying. Now, in the last few weeks, we have been waving the yellow flag, if you will, as it relates to valuations among tech stocks in general, but especially among those companies that we describe as speculative emerging tech stocks. As this chart shows, a group of about 35 speculative uh, stocks uh, that we keep our eyes on have exploded in their performance this year. You see from the market lows in March, this group of stocks has increased fourfold through the end of August, trounced in the S&P 500 and the light blue line, and the high-quality stocks 
uh, I own in our uh, large cap digital revolution um, uh, themes. Now, downside pressure in these stocks in recent days may just be the start of a more prolonged correction process. It's an overdue uh, correction process, I think. You never know when stocks are on a run, whether they're going to continue, but it's, it, they, it, they, they are overdue for a, a correction because if you look at this uh, slide, there's really no room for error with these stocks. These uh, metrics here show that the valuation for these stocks is exorbitantly high. If you look in the center, the red bar, enterprise value to EBITDA, that is almost 150 times, way, way above the S&P 500, way, way above <coughs> the quality tech stocks that, that we own. You look to the far right, the PE for these stocks is astronomical, I, I, I dare say, 275 times earnings. Now, it's high because a lot of these stocks are early stage, many are still losing money, reliance on capital markets to fund operations are barely uh, profitable. But 275 times earnings doesn't leave <clears throat> much room for um, error. Um, now, we at CNR, we don't own these exorbitantly valued emerging tech stocks. As I said, many of these are very highly speculative. At some point, these stocks are going to meaningfully correct. And as the late 90s showed, many of these companies are not going to be around for the long term, and investors who go chasing them will be hurt. We at CNR remain valuation disciplined and are staying away from them and instead focusing on quality uh, companies at reasonable valuations. With that, I'll stop, turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Lindsay. Take it away, Lindsay. All right, thank you, Tom. Some really great insights both you and Garrett shared. And continuing on the topic of how we are navigating this low interest rate environment, today I'm going to be highlighting our opportunistic income asset class. I first want to kick it off with a quick refresher around a question I often get. That is, what is opportunistic fixed income? Often a perplexing asset class to clients and advisors. Opportunistic income, or op income, as we often refer to it, is an asset class at CNR that on the taxable side includes high yield bonds, emerging market debt, collateralized loan obligations, and bank loans and on the non-taxable side includes a national high-yield municipal bond strategy. In the chart that we're illustrating here, we're using the Barclays U.S. Corporate High Yield Index um, in the opportunistic space and illustrating how over the course of a 10-year period, there has been additional volatility as measured by standard deviation on the horizontal axis. The one thing that I did want to point out is, at, while there was more volatility on an annual basis, there's been more than double the return year over year versus treasuries. As we extrapolate that out further, the same occurrence has occurred over corporate bonds. So you can see that the small amount of additional short-term volatility has far outweighed from a return perspective. When you look at it or take a hypothetical $1 million investment over the course of 10 years, the end result when invested in high yield U.S. bonds is $2.04 million, as opposed to corporate bonds at $1.44 million and treasuries at $1.361 million. This is a difference of $630 and $713,000 respectively, not a small amount. Additionally, current yield on high yield is 5.5% versus investment grade corporate bonds at 1.3%, making high yield more attractive than ever. While interest rates have been on the decline over the past 40 years, we have been able to use opportunistic income to achieve client yield objectives while not overly exposing portfolios to excessive duration risk. Opportunistic income is a building block in portfolio construction for both its yield and total return objectives, and as interest rates are expected to remain low in the intermediate future, op income will have an overweight in client portfolios and be essential in achieving long-term objectives. When we look ahead, active management, including fundamental research and shifts in portfolio positioning, is crucial in the opportunistic income space. As illustrated in the chart, you can see the four areas of the CNR Fixed Income Opportunities Fund and the shifts in positioning made from one year ago. We have reduced exposure to EM debt and bank loans 
and increased exposure to high yield bonds and collateralized loan obligations. For instance, CLOs are currently yielding 9.3%. All tactical shifts based on the current environment. These proactive shifts in allocation have added both value and yield. COVID-19 continues to be the most important macro factor driving positioning, and there will be less of an expected impact from the election. However, there's usually volatility within this segment heading into elections and their potential policy proposals that could affect issues in some of the larger industries like healthcare, consumer services, and in energy. These are questions I'm often getting, um, the sustainability of, of the investment underlying the fixed income fund. Sustainable infrastructure and clean energy are areas that could benefit and be possible shifts in the underlying holdings depending on the outcome. On the non-taxable side, possible changes in the top income tax bracket can make the high yield muni bond strategy more attractive. Our fundamental analysis, as Garrett touched on at the beginning, um, when we look at the individual credits we own, this is very crucial as we navigate individual states' abilities to maintain their debt through the pandemic. We utilize taxable and tax-exempt strategies efficiently to create the highest level of tax-efficient yield and return. So you've probably heard your portfolio manager talking about location optimization as key between taxable and non-taxable accounts. We're also actively using volatility in the space and possible changes in policy as buying opportunities rather than negative. Um, active management is key in providing additional yield and capital appreciation over time while mitigating volatility and ultimately at the end of the day, achieving clients' long-term goals and objectives. We continue to believe that this asset class is beneficial today and in the future as we continue in this low rate environment. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, portfolio manager, Rachel Crane. Thank you, Lindsay. And as we have in recent weeks, today we're going to be discussing how we're integrating this all together, our economic outlook, the critical planning done by financial advisors, and the portfolio construction to help achieve those client goals. And active asset management is the foundation of, of reaching those goals. Um, we can see the multiple layers of decision making that go into portfolio construction and ongoing management. Once the specific client goals are established with an advisor, the most impactful decision is the asset allocation, determining which asset classes to be invested in and which to avoid based on the current environment. Once that allocation is established, it's then important to focus on the type of individual securities which in e within each asset class, specific stock and sector se selections, and regional equity positioning, as an example. Then on an ongoing basis, it's also vital to manage risk and tax consequences to enhance client returns and avoid behavioral biases that can lead to lower portfolio returns. Active management, uh, is adaptable and flexible in volatile markets. For example, an active manager can choose not to invest, and they can hold cash until they see an opportunity. As we bring together these as aspects of active management, we see an increase in the probability of reaching client goals. Building the appropriate asset allocation is the foundation for the portfolio construction. And as we compare, asset allocation of an average advisor here on the left versus the CNR recommended allocation, you can see that what we recommend using is a broader number and different types of asset classes. Rather than focusing heavily in traditional core investment grade bonds, especially in this low interest rate environment, we look to opportunistic fixed income and high dividend paying stocks to increase that income. As Lindsay discussed, opportunistic fixed income is, a, is an area that we, are, we have a lot of conviction in, especially now going forward. We also recommend a targeted approach to international equity investments, specifically with a focus on emerging Asia equities. These recommendations are rooted in our forward-looking economic and market outlook and are adaptive to a changing environment. What we're recommending today may be different than what we recommend six months from now or two years from now. And rather than establishing an asset allocation that's static, 
we use our toolbox to adapt to that changing environment by making those recommendations and changes over time. A recent example uh, shows the benefits of active asset allocation. The decision to overweight or underweight NASA class will have a significant impact on portfolio returns over time. This chart shows the last five years of performance for different equity asset classes in the US and internationally. As you can see, we are and have been overweight the S&P 500 stocks, high dividend paying stocks, and emerging Asia. These decisions have benefited portfolio returns over the last five years. In addition, and something you actually don't see on your portfolio performance numbers, are the asset classes we avoided or were underweight. So being underweight developed international markets like Europe and being underweight broad emerging markets, that also has enhanced portfolio returns by limiting or eliminating the exposure to those lower returning asset classes. And we bring this together uh, to show the impact on a client portfolio. So this is an example of a retired client who's looking to withdraw a sustainable income for the portfolio, from the portfolio, and have those funds last throughout their lifetime. The passive traditional management approach, meaning a large overweight to investment grade bonds and a static asset allocation, leads to a lower annual income and it increases the speed of spending down the portfolio. The active management approach, using a dynamic asset allocation over time and adding to that task man tax management and risk management increases the annual income that's generated and reduces the speed of spending down that portfolio. In this environment, particularly as, as Lindsay went through the opportunistic income category, we think it's vital to review your goals with your advisor to review your portfolio and as we've been doing, integrate those goals with the optimized asset allocation to increase the probability of reaching your long-term long goals. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ben for questions. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, just a quick reminder that if you have a question, you can submit it in the Q&A console. Uh, we have quite a few uh, lined up already. Uh, I'm gonna start with you, Garrett, on the coronavirus outbreak. We've been working from home now for, I, I think, around six months, and we've noted a lot of progress in, in a lot of categories, particularly related to vaccine development and case counts. What is the outlook for returning to the office and getting back to some sort of normal work life? Many businesses have targeted the beginning of 2021 as a time frame to bring back somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the workforce. Yes, uh, I'm talking major corporations. Uh, some businesses are doing that now, of course, bringing back 10 to 20 percent, but a lot of businesses are uh, waiting until the seasonality issue with the potential flu in the winter to make a decision on whether they're going to bring people back uh, November, December, or early next year. Thanks, Garrett. And, and related to that, and somewhat on the same subject for a lot of people, is the back-to-school situation. We have a lot of uh, kids going back to school this week, actually, um, and there's a lot of different approaches to this. What is uh, the key or the outlook for schools uh, reopening successfully? We've talked many times about the proven, you know, absence of vaccine. Uh, all of the data uh, been proven time and time again. Uh, wear a mask, wash your hands, uh, test people, trace isolation and quarantine those that test positive. Uh, try doing that on um, school kids um, or uh, as we've all seen in the papers, uh, college kids. Um, it's just not a behavioral uh, tendency they're gonna have. So we expect very erratic and mixed results on school openings. Um, and we really don't see the ability uh, to have a secure 
a school environment, whether it's grade school, high school, or college. So uh, we think it's going to be quite erratic uh, throughout uh, the first couple months. Thanks, Garrett. Uh, Tom, I'm just going to move over to you to talk a little bit about the economy and portfolio positioning. You mentioned the valuations of some of these smaller emerging tech stocks. Um, we've seen a lot of volatility over the past few days. What is your outlook for, say, the next six to 12 months um, with respect to there being a, a more broad correction in the market? So the influence of technology on the returns for the S&P 500 this year have been very high, very well documented. The rise in Amazon, Apple has accounted for an overwhelming percentage of the increase in the S&P 500. So the triggers for the volatility that we've seen in the last couple of days has been several fold. Firstly, uh, a couple of companies have uh, indicated that they're while their Q2 results were good, the um, outlook for spending in Q3 and the second half of the year were less than they, they, they thought. Secondly, uh, the Trump administration has taken uh, moves to prevent shipment of equipment to some Chinese semiconductor uh, companies, so the risks of the trade war heating up in the uh, short term um, have been somewhat fun fundamental um, reminders to people uh, in technology that they're not going to just grow to the sky, that there, 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 there are risks. And so uh, in the near term, it's always difficult to gauge how corrections are going to happen and bubbles, if you will, rise in uh, certain stocks. But uh, these, uh, the sector, I, I, I think, is overdue for a corrective process. I do believe it's just going to be a corrective process uh, because the economy is improving this year, and we're expecting it to continue uh, into uh, next year. But if in the short term, particularly as we get towards the end of September, there's a lot of fast money traders out there that may want to look to lock in their profits in tech, lock it in for the uh, end of the quarter, we could have some more volatility in tech. I wouldn't be surprised to see that. I think if they um, have another 5%, 10% correction, the S&P should be down less. Uh, but those really speculative names should be down a lot more. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we're getting a few questions on the broader economy, particularly about small businesses. Uh, this is a segment that was hit very hard in the initial set of lockdowns. What's the outlook um, for that segment of the economy and the impact on the recovery? Yeah, small businesses are a backbone of job creation in the U.S. Historically, we have some of the greatest um, corporations in the world, but we're really a, a nation of uh, small businesses. So we keep our eyes closely on uh, how they're doing. Um, as you rightly pointed out, uh, Ben, a lot of them got hurt in the uh, lockdown stages. Many are reopening. The sad truth of it all is that uh, many businesses are going to be you know, shutting their doors uh, permanently, some of those jobs never to return. I think part of the reason why we don't see unemployment um, getting back up to pre-levels, pre-COVID levels for many years is, is a result of that uh, dynamic that small uh, that don't have the cash cushion, that, that, that don't have a, a, a particular area of strength is, is likely to um, be hurt. And, and we have factored that into our uh, forecast. The um, uh, good news is that if you look at some of the surveys of uh, smaller uh, businesses, their hiring plans uh, are expected to increase. And the uh, JOLTS data, the job openings data, can, continues to be a healthy 6 million uh, level. So it's going to be uh, a challenge for many small businesses uh, uh, firms, many are going to have their sh doors shut, particularly in the leisure uh, space. Uh, but even the dynamic nature of the economy and other corporations are, are, are likely to step in and fill that uh, void. Back to you, Ben. Thanks, Tom. Um, Lindsay, just a couple of quick questions for you. 
you talked quite a bit about opportunistic income and the potential benefits you see for uh, different client situations. How do you think about how much to allocate a particular client portfolio to this segment and, and where would you think about allocating from? Uh, thank you, Ben. It really depends on what the overall goals and objectives are for the client. So if you're thinking of a, a purely gross client um, where possibly some of the, the growth stocks are looking pretty richly valued now, we might be adding a opportunistic fixed um, income allocation there to reduce some of the volatility going forward. Um, on the other side, where we have more of a yield-focused client, where they would traditionally have a larger allocation to investment-grade bonds, instead of moving all of you know a large portion up into equity to get yield, the opportunistic income space um, really helps to enhance returns by moving some of that fixed income, investment-grade fixed income, out into opportunistic income. So. It really depends um, where it's coming from. It really can come from both equities or bonds. But I would say the target range is somewhere from on the low end of 5%. That would be a really growth tilted investor to at the higher end, 20, 25% would be the ranges that we're looking at. Thanks, Lindsay. And, and in terms of how we think about the actual risk level of the portfolio, how do you balance the shorter term volatility that you might see in an opportunistic income portfolio relative to other fixed income asset classes? Uh, so when we think of short term volatility, it's important to remember it's not the same as a risk of loss when you're looking at a more reasonable holding period longer than one or two years. So if you look at a five to 10 year time frame, So we think that um, while we can't truly predict what's going to happen from a volatility perspective or what investors are going to do in the short term, if you do hold it for a longer period, the benefits are, are far outweighed by the short term risk. And in this case, when I mentioned in the presentation, we're looking at at this point at five and a half percent yields versus one and a half percent yields, or on the opposite side, if you look over a ten year holding period, uh, high yield bonds have outpaced treasuries by more than double year over year. so we we do you do have to focus on the fact that that short term volatility, while it can exist, is not a true risk of loss if held for the appropriate time period. So it's more of a understanding long-term goals and objectives rather than, you know, looking at a one-year time frame. Thank you, Lindsay. Rachel, I'm going to turn over to you for a moment. Um, you talked a little bit about active versus passive, and passive has been on the rise, and it's something that we agree can, can uh, uh, satisfactorily achieve certain clients' goals. Um, but could you discuss a little bit the differences in tax management and how that is implemented and what the potential outcomes of that are between active and passive? Yes, good question. Um, one of the reasons investors cite the use of the passive approach is that passive funds trade less and don't realize capital gains. But active management actually has the advantage when it comes to minimizing taxes because we can do tax loss harvesting uh, during temporary volatile periods of volatility, something we did earlier this year and we've talked about on previous webinars, um, and that accumulates losses to use against future gains. And that actually increases the after-tax return. So the overall total return and after-tax can be higher with active management. Thanks, Rachel. And, and as we think about goals and passive versus active management, one topic that comes to mind is this idea of personalization that you discussed and things that have become increasingly popular, for example, passive target date funds that do all around asset allocation. Can you discuss the differences in terms of being able to target personalized goals between active and passive management? Yes, and, and as I had shown on that example, Income creation is key here. So often a, a high priority goal for clients in retirement or nearing retirement is generating a, a 
sustainable amount of income in the portfolio. Well, that has to be adaptive. If you use a passive approach or a target date fund, that is responding to years passing. That's not responding to economic changes. So as Lindsay talks about opportunistic income and we've talked about high dividend paying stocks, adding that to a portfolio in a time like this with interest rates being lower actually increases the likelihood of reaching client goals. So adapting to the current economic environment and addressing the client goals through changes in the asset allocation, that customization increases the probability of actually reaching those goals. Thank you, Rachel. And it looks like uh, we've gotten to just about all of the questions. Um, if you have any other questions, um, please uh, take a look at the survey that will pop up shortly after, after the webinar is over. Um, your feedback and your suggestions for topics for us to address in the coming weeks are very much appreciated and they are the centerpiece of how we actually go about creating this presentation. So thank you for that. Um, a replay of this session will be available within 24 hours uh, and you'll receive an email letting you know how to access it. Have a great day and thank you again for being here with us.